I've been directly involved in the launch of over a dozen multi-site campuses through the churches I've led, and half of them have been in movie theaters. I'm convinced that every church leader should consider using a theater for your next campus or church plant. They're flexible, culturally relevant locations, typically in the center of the community that you're trying to reach. Regal is the only theater company with a dedicated team of full-time consultants ready to help your church launch and succeed in a movie theater. Check out Regal Theater church.com for more information on locations your church could use welcome to the unseminary podcast are you looking for practical ministry help to drive your ministry further faster have a sinking feeling that your ministry training didn't prepare you for the real world hey you're not alone join thousands of others in pursuit of stuff that we wish they had taught in seminary buckle up and let's get started with this week's unseminary podcast well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. My name's Rich. I'm super excited that you decided to listen to us today. I know you've got a lot going on at your church, and we're honored that you would uh, take some time out to listen in today. Uh, today, we've got Dan Zimbardi from Sandals Church. He's the executive pastor there. Sandals is one of these churches that you need to be following. That's a great church. Uh, Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rich. Yeah, nice. Why don't you tell us about Sandals? Tell us about the church uh, you know, the name may give away a little bit of your location, but uh, why don't you tell us about uh, about your church? You got it, man. Sandals Church started 20 years ago in Riverside, California by uh, Pastor Matt and Tammy Brown. And uh, they started the church uh, here in Southern California and uh, started it in their living room. You know, the, the first gathering was with eight people in their living room. Pastor Matt went out and knocked on, I think, about 3,000 doors in the neighborhood and, uh, you know, it's just been incredible to see what God has done s- since then. Uh, the church moved many, many years, uh, moved around from location to location, uh, apartment complexes and, uh, you know, borrowing space from other churches. Uh, we were at a local university for, for 10 years using the gym and some of their uh, classroom space. And then about six years ago, when our, our lease was up at the university, we finally found uh, our permanent home and uh, we moved to, to where we're at today, our, our, our main campus, which is called Hunter Park. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, six years ago, we launched our first satellite campus and since then two more campuses. So Sandals is a church of uh, currently four campuses. Uh, we're seeing about 8,300 or so people come on weekends. Mm-hmm to each of those four campuses. So the church has come a long way uh, by God's grace and and a lot of hard work and commitment. Um, And Pastor Matt and Tammy have just done an amazing job to to lead and serve our church. Mm, Very cool. Well, I know um, sustaining and kind of keeping your culture aligned through that kind of growth, even just the few changes that you talked about there, facility changes, launching campuses, kind of keeping things aligned obviously is incredibly important. Um, How have you done that? What does that look like to kind of Um, keep your team pushing in the same direction. Yeah, I heard a a couple years ago a great quote. It's not mine. Uh, Someone said, culture eats vision for lunch. And I think it's so true. I mean, you can put your vision statement on the wall. You can put it on lots of documents. You can talk about it. But ultimately, it's, it's the culture. And the culture to me is how people respond, how people react, how people treat one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, do people feel like they can uh, do their best work and, and, and take a shot? Do people feel like they can fail and still uh, be recognized and, and, and be okay? And so culture is really sort of the outward expression of, uh, of, of what's happening inside the, the church and the organization. And so for, for us, it's been a lot, of, the last, I'd say two to three years is about defining our culture. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't define your culture, ultimately, it just becomes a byproduct of, of maybe a few personalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may be a byproduct of things that have happened in the church over the years. Mm. And so we've spent the last two or three years really, uh, really defining our culture, hmm. uh, making sure our values are clear, the, the attributes of our staff uh, that make people successful and thrive in our environment. So hmm. um, we've been focusing on defining that. And now as we head into this next season, we're really about evangelizing our culture throughout our organization, throughout our staff, mm-hmm. our licensed ministers. And um, we have a, a whole team that's driving our culture initiatives forward to, mm-hmm. to evangelize our culture. And mm-hmm. ultimately, we want our culture 
to be the thing that really draws people to want to come and work at Sandals Church mm-hmm. and really do their life's work mm-hmm. and uh, and also allow us to retain our, our staff as well. Mm-hmm. And so um, we really see culture as, in some ways as being a differentiator for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when I say that, I mean a differentiator in terms of uh, where people will work. There's lots of great churches in town. There's mm-hmm. lots of great marketplace opportunities. There's lots of uh, really incredible institutions and universities around. Mm-hmm. And so um, we're trying to draw in uh, really talented people, people that love the Lord, people that really are sold on the vision of being mm-hmm. real with ourselves, God, and others. And um, and so to do that, you know, there's many things that we have to do to accomplish those kinds of goals. <laughs> Absolutely. But man, cult- culture is a huge part of that. And so um, and one of the things that we do, just as a, as a side note, mm-hmm. to understand how are we doing with our culture in terms of evangelizing that, uh, we do an annual staff uh, anonymous survey, mm. and we ask our, our staff how are we doing with our values and with our culture, mm-hmm. and um, and then year over the year we compare the results to determine where are we heading. Are we heading mm-hmm. up, Very heading cool. down? And then the things that are, are not going so well from a culture perspective, we build action plans around that and then drive that for the rest of that year. Mm, very cool. Well, I, you know, let's let's kind of step back there and, and pull apart a little bit of what you said. I'd love to know, you know, give us a sense of how you went about defining culture. I think, um, you know, for so many people, you know, it's about how do we take things that are implicit and make them explicit? So what did you do? Um, how did you kind of listen and learn, you know, from your culture to say, okay, yeah. this is actually who we are. This is, you know, this is the taking this, you know, big amorphous idea and saying, okay, here's actually how it articulated itself. What did that process look like? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So um, twofold. One is, and and, and I think this first part, we, we sort of stumbled upon this. I, I started thinking one day, you know, what are the things that Pastor Matt and I are constantly talking about as we're evaluating people, whether we're evaluating current staff or thinking about future hires, what are the things that we talk about over and over and over again that are really important to us mm-hmm that we think are also important to the DNA and ultimately the success of the church and leading people to Christ. And so um, I I literally just sat there one afternoon and started pounding out these key ideas about the attributes of successful people, Mm. people that are thriving when I say successful, people that are thriving in our environment. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with things like a high motor and capacity. (laughs) You know, people that thrive in our environment, they tend to have a high motor and capacity. They they know when to go from second gear to fourth and fifth gear (laughs) on on their own. You know, I mean, they don't have to be told and and, and managed in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started defining things like that. I started defining agility, like this was a key thing for us. Um, as a church, we're, we're changing, we're changing a lot mm-hmm. uh, for, for a couple reasons. One, our society and culture is changing so fast, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're living in, in, in a time and a space where uh, our society is just changing at an incredible rate. Right. And at the same time, uh, Pastor Matt and I, we're, we're change agents as mm-hmm. just the people that we are. And so instead of apologizing uh, day in and day out about all the change that's happening, we said, no, 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 we're going to define that as part of our culture. It's who we are. And so yeah. it's who we are, you mm-hmm. know. And so if you're going to if you're going to come and join us and join us on this mission, you need to understand that this is what we're about. If you really struggle with agility, mm-hmm. um, you know maybe this isn't the best the best environment for you. And so, um, so we started identifying those types of things that were just common threads in our conversations. You know, we we talk uh, Pastor Matt and I all the time, uh, Sunday afternoons or just one on ones throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And when I just started capturing what are those things that are so important to us. Um, so that was step one: is is identifying what are those attributes of staff that thrive mm-hmm. here. And then two is just really honing in our our values. What are our organizational values? What are the things that that are so important to us and haven't been important to the church uh, all these years? And so we've created this this document. We call it our ethos document. Mm. Um, we've we've driven it into our how we review staff. We've driven it into uh, the orientation that we do with new hires. Mm-hmm. So we're just constantly bringing people back to our ethos. Uh, and then part of that, I'd say, finally is uh, just uh, as we make decisions, you know, we're also reinforcing our values and, and our culture. So that's how, back to your question, that's how it started. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we sat down and said, um, what do we talk about over and over and over again? <laughs> right. And we just started committing that to paper. And I think that's an easy exercise for, for people to do if they're not sure, hey, where do I start with mm-hmm. defining my culture? 
What do you talk about over and over and over again that's, right. that's important to you and your leadership? Very cool. Well, let's talk about what, you know, how you've then ended up propagating that through your culture. What are some, you talked mm -hmm. about the ethos document. What kind of, what are you doing to kind of, from a, you know, leadership development pipeline sort of point of view mm -hmm. to kind of push that out and continue to make sure that you're focusing your people on that? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple things. Let me I'll, let me start with leadership. You know, for for us, you know, uh, as as a really fast go, uh, growing church, uh, we've got a handful of barriers to dynamic growth. I mean, one is is finances. We have to have a finances and a financial mo uh, model. Mm -hmm. We have to have you know standard, consistent processes that drive excellence. But one of the biggest areas, and I think this is for most churches that are adding lots of campuses and that are growing significantly, mm -hmm. is having leaders in place to step into key roles. Right. You know, if you're going to add two, three, four campuses per year, if you're a larger church, mm -hmm. you need campus pastors, right? right? On, on your bench, you need worship leaders, you need kids ministry folks. And, um, and for a church like ours, where culture and DNA is so important to us, we can't just go hire someone, you know, from down the street or across the country who may be an amazing leader, right. but they don't understand our culture and DNA and then put them in a, in a new location to lead it. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we've created a, a, a leadership development system. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it Rogo Leadership School, mm -hmm. R-O-G-O, mm -hmm. Real With Ourselves, God and Others. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's really been an amazing system. It's it's a 12-month. It's like a real high-end intern program. Yep. That's really focused on learning by doing, learning leadership by doing. Mm. Uh, everyone that comes into the to Rogo School is given uh, a mentor. Mm -hmm. They're assigned a ministry pathway. The pathway is is where they're heading. You know, if we're going to hire them in a year, mm -hmm. are they going to be a campus pastor? Are they going to be a worship leader? Are they going to be a guest services person? So they get into that pathway, and then we we start handing them real leadership roles, projects, and assignments. Mm. Um, they're not. Ha I like to say they're not handing out bulletins at the door. Right. That's not, that's not leadership. While that's very important, it's just mm -hmm. it's not leadership. And mm -hmm. so we're giving them big things to work on. One of our folks uh, last year, they led our organization through an entire reorg. Mm. So one of the people in our Rogo school wow. uh, worked side by side with me to reorg, you know, about 80 or so staff. Mm -hmm. um, that was a huge project. And he learned a lot about um, how, how to manage and drive change. You know, people really care about their titles. <laughs> it's true. People care, people care about their roles or responsibilities, and we want them to care. Right. And so how you drive change across that is so key. So he got to learn a lot about change management in, in that situation. So all that to say, we've created, you know, a, a really intentional program and system to uh, identify leaders, uh, put them on our bench, train them, and ultimately release them as we're ready and we're growing for mm -hmm. new campuses or whatever, man, we're ready to go. And so I would say to, to, to churches in general um, that you need a leadership development system mm -hmm. uh, to, to train up, whether it's pastors or ministers or other key areas of your church. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do that. And then through that Rogo School, by the way, I'm constantly reinforcing uh, our ethos, mm -hmm. our, our values, mm -hmm. what's important to us in our culture, um, so that they understand that, uh, especially if they're coming from other churches and, and spending a year with us. So, mm -hmm. so I think that that is one. And then two, uh, we have a team that meets. It's the Culture Project team, mm -hmm. and they are constantly developing a roadmap for how we're going to uh, evangelize our culture. How are we okay. going to make sure our staff understands? what our culture is about. So one of the things they're working on is, is recognition. Mm. Uh, through, our, through our annual staff survey, uh, one of the things our staff said is, you know, I would like to be recognized more for, right. for the work that I do. And that's hugely important for yep. all of us. Yep. And, um, and so they're working on a handful of initiatives uh, to really inject uh, recognition into our processes, into our everyday life around the office and in mm. our work and our ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a couple months, they'll roll those things out. And so, so we have a team that's focused on um, how do we drive all the things that are important to us from a cultural perspective into our workflow, into our day-to-day -day activities. We've, we've, man, we've changed our, our performance reviews um, so that it's driven a lot around our culture. Our staff meetings, we don't disseminate information. We talk about, this, again, things that are important to us in our staff meetings like culture and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so those are just at a real high level. There's lots of practical things that we're doing. Um, but we have a, a team that's focused on driving culture, mm -hmm. and then we've got a leadership development system uh, as well that's helping to raise up uh, our, our next generation of leaders. Cool. Was there a uh, a portion of your culture, like I think some of the, um, when we're defining or when we're, we're articulating culture, some of this is around 
um, defining what is true already. And some of it is aspirational or it's, yeah. it's, it's a push towards aspirational. It's like, you know, yeah. we're, we're kind of heading in that direction, but we want to clarify that, it, that the future organization, future sandals is more like this than we are today. Was mm -hmm. there a part of this culture defining process that you said, actually, you know, what is a little more aspirational is a little more change oriented, a little more like, mm, we need to actually push forward in a new direction here. What, and what was that? And how did, how has that gone as you've tried to articulate that to people? Yeah, I, I would probably start at like a hundred thousand uh, foot with that, with that uh, question. Okay. And that is, I, I've said this, that we're, we're trying to create a world-class culture. Yep. You know, I, I was really fortunate in my uh, corporate life for many years to work with companies like Google and, and just incredible industry leaders. So I got to see um, how important culture was for them and how much that was a differentiator yep. as they're trying to hire and retain talent that other you know, high-tech companies or other companies are trying to recruit. And so I learned a lot about that. And so we've set this goal of creating this a world-class culture and a world-class environment mm. where people want to come and ultimately do their life's work. And so that was, you've probably heard the term BHAG before, mm -hmm. a big, mm -hmm. hairy, audacious goal. So that, that, that's been really our, our, our goal. And so um, I, I think that that's the best way to answer the question is um, we're trying to set something that is so far out, especially in the church environment. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that churches think about um, being the absolute best when it comes to the environment where people work or thinking about culture and differentiating themselves. And so we understand we have a huge task in front of us. Um, and part of that is just because we're under-resourced. You know, we don't, we don't have, what does Apple have in the bank? You know, $200 right. billion. Dollars, I right. don't even know what the latest count is. Right. Um, you know, so for them and, and Google, uh, these guys have so much, they're f so flush with cash. Yep. They can do so many things to create this wonderful and amazing culture. You know, at Google, they, they had nap rooms right. where you could just go and take a nap. You know, people right. love working at Google. <laughs> it's free food and you can take a nap. You know? <laughs> and so we, we, we don't exactly have $200 billion right. in the bank at Sandals Church. Yep. And so we have to be incredibly creative about... Um, how do we create an environment where the, the, the best designers that are out there from across the country would say, man, what, what's really amazing about that place is, is their culture, the work that they do, the lives that are being changed, mm -hmm. um, how I can be challenged, how I can learn new things, how I can be treated really well, mm -hmm. how I can be part of a family where I'm deeply known. I mean, all these things help to define our culture. And so I, I think, yeah, the best answer to that question is we started with a really sort of audacious vision Mm -hmm. for our, our environment that we wanted to create. And, and we're not there. We understand that, you know, mm -hmm. but we're building towards that. We have a lot of, I think, the right things in place and people and vision and even strategy mm -hmm. that's going to get us, that's going to get us there. Hmm. I it just underlined something you said that struck me that you were, you know, part of what you want to, want to do is create a place where people can do their life's work. Um, that's a powerful idea. That's a powerful cultural driver that at the end of the day, we want to gather people together to literally, you're going to do the best work of your life here. Um, yeah. that, that, that sounds is, pretty good, doesn't it? That's amazing. No, it's great. I think that, you know, that is a, that's a huge vision yeah. for people. You know, we talked and, about at liquid church, we talked about, we wanted to be, uh, or they want to be the, you know, the best place in New Jersey for people to work. Mm -hmm. And, and like people look at us like we're crazy, right? You're like, what are you talking about? Like, come on, that's, and, and, and we weren't there yet, right? We're not there yet. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you don't set the goal, if you don't say, man, we want to keep hacking away at that. We want this to be an amazing place for people to work. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I think just a couple of thoughts. One, you have to be intentional around mm -hmm. around that vision. There's there's just so many vision statements up on a wall and right. businesses and churches around around the world that um, that just stick there and there's no intentionality behind it. And so we, we're really focused on being intentional around the things that we're doing to really achieve that where people are saying, man, this is this is the best place. And part of that is asking our staff, is this the kind of place where you can do your life's work in our mm -hmm. survey? Mm -hmm. And in the areas where they say no, we, we start tackling that. We start right. going after that. And we were in a meeting yesterday actually reviewing last year's survey results and the analysis of it and starting to build our action plans for this year. One of the things our staff said in this last survey was, um, they would really love more investment in pers their personal development. Mm. And so we're talking about, how, how, again, how do we do that and do mm -hmm. it really well mm -hmm. with without having $200 billion in the bank? Right, <laughs> right, know, right, 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 right. Back to the resource challenge um, that is there. And so, um, and, and I would say this too, you know, part of that vision for me is just born out of, you know, I left corporate America to come to Sandals to, to uh, come alongside Pastor Matt Brown, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to do my life's work. You know, mm -hmm. I was I was entering in that the 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 halftime or the second half of my life and career, 
And um, what really was important to me is that I, I, I could do my life's work, you know, mm-hmm. what, what God really has designed me for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so I think out of that has come this, and I feel like I'm doing that. I feel mm-hmm. like I'm doing mm-hmm. what God has designed me for. I can't wait to get to work every day. When, mm-hmm. I, when I get out of bed, I'm so excited to get into work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I want that same feeling for, for everyone that works at Sandals mm-hmm. and serves at Sandals Church. Mm-hmm. Very cool, very cool. Well, I know a lot of times churches, uh, the only thing they quantify is the number of people sitting in their services on Sundays and the amount of money yeah. that comes in in the offering plate. Yeah. Um, how are you using metrics and you know dashboards, that sort of thing, to try to drive yeah. cultural change or to drive improvement in you know at Sandals? What does that look like for you guys? Yeah, well, I think I think one again culturally, I was in our uh, Rogo School home base meeting yesterday. Mm-hmm. I was talking to uh, the different groups I was meeting with. And I was talking about measuring work, actually. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, at the end of this year, and I asked them to write this down. I said, at the end of this year, how will you know if you and your team and your ministry did a great job or not? Right. How will you know that? And if right. your answer is subjective, uh, like if you're in youth ministry, oh, I've had a lot of parents tell me that their, their son or daughter is right. being discipled. Right. Well, that's a very subjective and I would say even, even an emotional statement. And so... Right. Um, even in the church, it's not just a marketplace, but even in the church, you can measure things. And, I, and I've, I've come to understand there's sort of two camps in the church around measuring, mm. some that believe in measuring, some that, that don't. And, mm. and I, I'm certainly in the camp that believes that measuring things is important. You know, Rick Warren and many others have said that every number is a story and a face and a soul, and God cares mm. about every single one of those numbers. And so, um, so for us, it, it starts with um, it's key for, for our entire staff to be thinking about what to measure and actually start tracking and measuring things that are important to them. Mm. And so, um, and so we're, we're trying to drive that. We are driving that throughout our organization. You know, we've got top level scorecards that go up to our board. We have a scorecard for our executive team uh, as well. Uh, inside of our departments, they've developed uh, different scorecards and measures. Um, and then part of that, and, and I'll get into more specifics mm-hmm. in a second, mm-hmm. but again, again, trying to drive culture like, Metrics isn't something that one team does, but it, metrics and measuring is part of what we, we all, all do because yep. it's important, yep. you know. Um, but then I would say a part of it is is is, is identifying what you want to measure. Number mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. number two, set setting goals mm-hmm. against those. Uh, three is tracking against those goals, <laughs> and and then four is um, is basically the analysis that says um, what drove those results. Right. You know, whatever you're measuring, if 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 we're if we're tanking. What do we think? What do we believe is driving the fact that we're tanking? Mm. If we're soaring, what do we believe we're doing to, to mm-hmm. make that that measure of measurement soar? And so I think I think that's the sort of the, the broad spectrum of how you how you have to look at uh, measurements and, and, and metrics. And, and I think the final thing along that line is just making folks accountable for, mm-hmm. for those things. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really key in our scorecard meeting every month. Uh, each person, get, campus pastors get up and other directors get up and they present. Uh, the results, they present the drivers, and they talk about where we're heading in, in the next month or quarter. Mm-hmm. And man, there's a lot of accountability knowing that they've got to get up uh, mm-hmm. each month and present that to the team. Right. And, and our hope is that knowing they have to do that, they're going to spend their month focusing on those those mm-hmm. things that we have determined are, are most are most important. So mm-hmm. so I think that's sort of the, the broad answer around measures and, and, and metrics. And, you know, we're, we're obviously measuring some of the things that you had talked about, but from a discipleship perspective, we're measuring uh, people that are in our, our three environments. So one is weekend attendance, mm-hmm. two is, is in uh, groups. We have a lot of different kinds of groups. Mm-hmm. And then three people that have joined teams and are serving. Those are our three key discipleship environments. So mm-hmm. getting people in there, um, how many are we growing or are we not growing? Mm-hmm. Our next set of measures is going to be around health in those three areas. Mm-hmm. So are people healthy? Um, and our people growing, and we're going to probably do that through um, through surveys, you mm-hmm. know, and asking them uh, if that's happening. We've got other uh, measures and metrics where we go out to parents and we ask them mm-hmm. to give us uh, their their feedback. We tally their feedback and determine if if, pro- if the programming is hitting the mark, or their kids growing in Christ, or they mm-hmm. growing being real. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we, we measure a lot of those kinds of things as well. For, for us, organizational health, this is one of the things that's near and dear to me, mm-hmm. we measure organizational health. Right. And we, we do that by asking our, our staff, um, are, are we healthy? We have the same, I don't know, I think it's 13 questions we ask every year, and then mm-hmm. we'll add one or two or three new ones. Mm-hmm. And then again, we compare those year over year. Because I don't want to say to our board or to other churches that I talk to that, 
we're really healthy. And then say that, you know, they say, well, how do you know that? Well, right. I, I talk to staff and they, they I feel it. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what I say is I'll say something like that and then I'll say, but here are the results. Here's right. what our staff is telling us. Right. It's an anonymous survey. We drill down into the department level. So mm-hmm. that's another thing that I think is important is drilling down in your data mm. to make sure you understand, uh, you know, maybe across uh, 80% of the organization is really healthy, but this one ministry or department is not. We need mm. to know that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so that we can work with that leader and coach them, uh, et cetera. So those, cool. that's how we think about measures and, and metrics. Very cool. Is there anything else you want to share with us before we move on with the rest of the episode? Um, I think that there's something that's been on, on my heart and I've talked about a lot, and mm-hmm. I think this for me feels like a, a good form to share, is just mm-hmm. going back to this idea of agility. Mm-hmm. Um, I really believe that you know things are changing so fast. I, you, you could literally go to start college now as a freshman in college, learn a programming language, and come out the other end in four or five years, and that language is either obsolete or not the, the, the hot programming language right. of the day. so true. Yep. We are moving so fast, Rich. I, I really believe that. And, mm-hmm. and I think leaders in the marketplace and in, in the church, they have to grow in agility. There's this great book that I've been reading. They define agility as knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> knowing mm-hmm. what to do when you don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we got a call recently from a guy that, that loves sandals, been watching online for, mm-hmm. for years. And uh, he wants to to start a sandals church in Arkansas. You know, we're in Southern California. Right. And I, I have no idea if we're going to do this. You know, we, right. we may not. We'll, we'll pray into it. We'll, we'll talk mm-hmm. about it, et cetera. But let's just say for a second we decide that's something that we want to do. Uh, we believe God is leading us to. We, we don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, we've never we've never ran, started and ran a church that's thousands of miles away. Mm-hmm. Um we don't know what to do, but but agility says we need to to know what to do and figure out what to do quickly. Right. Uh, because at Sandals Church, just like in culture, we're constantly faced with new things. Mm-hmm. Constantly faced with new things uh, because the church is changing and evolving, because society is changing and evolving. So what I would say to leaders and pastors is growing in agility. It should be a key thing for for all of us. Mm-hmm. Clearly, God's word doesn't change. God's right. word stays the same. So it's not about that. It's about all the things that are happening around us and inside of our church. Each generation, uh, there's so many people picking on millennials right now, which I think is pretty pretty uncool. But they, but yep. you know, when I was in my 20s and, and 30s as, as a Gen Xer, you know, my generation was being picked on. Yep. And the reality is, each generation presents something new. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't want to pick on uh, th- this current generation. I don't even like to use the word millennial because I think it's starting to carry this bad uh, tone to it. Right. But this generation that's coming up, like I want to relate well to them. I want to serve them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to help them. I want to be their their helper. And so I need to be agile myself because mm-hmm. they're dealing with things differently and it's new to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just think agility in the church should be something that uh, churches, especially churches that, that want to grow and that are growing, should be looking to, to drive throughout the organization of their church. This is the Unseminary Podcast. Stuff you wish they taught in seminary. Well, we're going to jump into the lightning round, that part of the episode where we ask similar questions of everybody that's on the episode Super honored to have Dan with us. He's executive pastor at Sandals Church. Dan, what's a book, I think I know where the answer is going on this, that you've read in the last six months uh, that's shaping your thinking or ministry? That's great. Yeah, definitely Becoming an Agile Leader. That's the book that I was talking about. It's a a great book for me because it's a short read, Rich. Uh, I I have a hard time getting through a book that's more than uh, 10 pages and has nine of them with pictures. So, um, no, it's it's a great book. I'd really recommend it. Again, it's a short read. Uh, I think you can find it out. uh, There's an incredible leadership institute called Corn Ferry. I believe they're out of the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're a secular organization. Um, but I highly, they have so many incredible, incredible resources. Mm. This particular book is is out there. I'm sure you can pick it up on Amazon as well. But I'd recommend people go to Corn Ferry because they have just amazing, amazing leadership resources for leaders in the church. Nice, very cool. Uh, when you think about you know other ministries that you look to to you know be inspired or other organizations you look at, who are you look to these days to be inspired or you know to think about the future? Well, I just I, I love people that are inter- innovating. You know, I, I love people that are trying something new that are um, willing to take a shot. I love to encourage our staff and our teams to to take a shot. It's actually the phrase that I use. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, think about um, you know App- Apple has taken a shot over the years, many shots, mm-hmm. that, and they've mm-hmm. you know created products that have changed the world. Obviously, Google, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, Uber. There's there's so many companies out there like that. So, so for me, I'm, I'm constantly f- following them. I'm trying to understand how they're thinking. 
Um, I, I love to understand how leaders are thinking. How are they approaching difficult situations? How are they approaching even just thinking about the future? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I tend to follow companies like that. There's, there's just, I don't know, there's tons of great ministries around the country. I think people know what a lot of those are. Um, but, uh, but I tend to follow more of what's happening out, out in the marketplace. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, if you could get 15 minutes with any leader alive, who would you want to get that with and why? Uh, gosh, man, um, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to try to give you two here. Good. So uh, <laughs> I think on the, on the creative side and, and the arts, I've just always been a huge U2 fan. So yeah. I, I love Bono and i um, really fascinated um, about uh, his, his faith and how, you know, and I don't fully understand his faith, but mm-hmm. I, um, I would love to talk to him about that and mm-hmm. how um, his faith has played a role in, in his career. And um, obviously, he's done a lot of great things around the world as well and, and, and created some amazing music, too. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a guy called Johnny Ives that works at Apple. He's mm-hmm. a very senior level guy. For a long time, he was their chief designer. And I think as Steve Jobs has passed away, I think he's take, taken even another step up. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a guy I would love to meet with and talk to. You know, you can go out on YouTube and watch videos of him talking about designing products, you know, the mm-hmm. iPhone, the MacBook. Mm-hmm. And he's just pouring over every single detail, mm-hmm. and um, and I'm just fascinated by that because Apple cares deeply about excellence. It happens to be a value of ours at Sandals Church, and so I'm I'm always fascinated about how how you approach and get to uh, to excellence. And so Johnny Ive would be a guy that I would love to learn from. Very cool, very cool. Well, I know leading in a ministry like yours, growing, it takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot of time, effort, and energy. What do you just do for fun? We just want to kick back, relax, uh, enjoy life a little bit. Man, I, I just I love hanging out with my wife. Nice. You know, uh, I really do. She um, she and I get Fridays off together, and so uh, our kids are in school. I'm off of work, and um, and so we just go and we get we get lost. You know, <laughs> we'll just go somewhere we haven't been. We'll walk around. We'll shop. We'll eat. We might go sit under a tree and read a book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, spending you know, I spend most of my days are just nine to five, and they're just locked down, man. Mm-hmm. I, you know, just with meetings and, 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 you know, talking with our teams. And so I love to just get away, disconnect Sabbath on Friday um, and, and spend time with the person that's really the most important person in the world to me, which is my wife. Very cool. Well, I appreciate being on the show today. If people want to get in touch with you or with the church, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm Dan Z at sandalschurch.com, D-A-N-Z at sandalschurch.com. I'd love to hear from anyone. And you know, we're, we're the kind of church that we love to help churches. If there's anything that, that we can do, we're certainly not great at everything. And um, I think we're, we're, you know, God's given us the gifts and talents and people to do a few things really well. Mm-hmm. If we can share any of our resources, tools, or, or thoughts with others, we love to do that because we want to help others who are looking to advance the kingdom. Uh, so yeah, shoot, shoot me an email. The church website, sandalschurch.com is uh, where you find us uh, on the web. Nice. Appreciate that, Dan. Thanks so much for being on the show today. You got it. See you, Rich. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Don't be shy. We'd love to connect. Check out Unseminary Inbox. You can sign up at unseminary.com and we'll send you helpful training resources every week. Plus, you'll gain immediate access to our exclusive members area with tons of resources you can use. Connect with Rich on Twitter at Rich Birch or through email rich at unseminary.com Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at unseminary.com It includes links to what we talked about today and more. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Did you enjoy today's episode? Drop by iTunes and leave a review. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Join us next week when we'll learn more stuff we wish they taught in seminary. <laughs>